Hi there, uh, I'm Noah Kantrutz. Like Fanima said, I'm an engineer at Geomagical Labs. We do the computer vision augmented reality stuff for IKEA. But I'm not really here to talk about the products that I work on, more about how we build them. So I know MLOps is the more popular term, but one, I just think it sounds silly, and two, we do a lot more than what most places classify as machine learning. Our production code runs the gamut from traditional computer vision algorithms to brand new machine learning research. Mostly I just call myself and my team engineers or platform engineers, but buzzwords are fun. So why bother extending self-service all the way to research teams? On the practical side, we don't have much of a choice. Uh, there's too many scientists, too few platform engineers, the SRE team is me, uh, so mostly we just have to. Additionally, a lot of our testing can only be done when there's a deployment in place. Doing full corpus test runs takes many hours, I think we're up to 14 hours, so running those before every merge would slow down development just a teensy bit. Also, it's just how I think all platforms should be run, but that's a story for another day. A quick aside about pipelines, or more generally, DAGs, directed acyclic graph runners. Like most machine learning systems, we keep our complexity under control by dividing it into smaller work stages and then connecting those together. Our internal jargon is pipelines and modules, but they go by many names depending on your libraries, frameworks. It's all the same design in the end. All of our researchers write code all day. We don't have anyone who's sitting off in a corner writing math papers, but their backgrounds are generally either academic research or similar very research heavy teams elsewhere. Very few have ever had someone sit down and do something like explain what makes a good unit test, for example. So step one of this journey was setting up guardrails so they'd feel confident moving forward. When I joined the team, there was some basic CI in place but it was only running nightly, so feedback was pretty slow, and there was a lot of, we know that test is failing, don't worry about it. This is not fine. So we quickly moved into a more standard CI setup, running tests on every commit, pull requests, status blocking, all that kind of stuff. BuildKite has been really great for our CI because it allows for extreme centralization of CI configs, so the module authors don't have to worry about how CI is configured at all. One notable complexity to testing when you're doing a lot of data science stuff is GPUs. A lot of our code uses CUDA for one reason or another, and so we need GPUs when we're running the tests or the performance tests will be way off and completely useless. Running GPU nodes in the cloud is very expensive, so our solution is a Kubernetes job-based CI runner inside BuildKite so that we can use our existing Kubernetes autoscaling for CI as well. What's actually running in CI? Mostly it's functional tests. We have canned work units sitting in various corpuses uh, in Google Cloud Storage, and we have a, a runner system that takes those canned units, has an internal metrics API, and uh, indicates whether the metrics are good high or good low. So the harness can take a unit, run it, check if the metrics are better than the last main branch build, and if it is a main branch build, update them in storage. This is really simple, and it does catch most of our common issues, but the problem is it's really slow. So we do have unit tests set up in our, our CI runner harness, and we do things like reporting unit test coverage, but we've run into some frustration uh, with requiring unit test coverage. So we recommend unit test coverage, we do not require it. Next on the list was revamping our code review process. Originally, code review was just kind of ad hoc. Whoever was around did it. We set up a new process where the most technical of the researchers could help the rest of them, just doing really basic stuff, checking common code quality issues, other basics. This is still research code. We're not expecting maximum design patterns ever, but a little bit of review does go a long way. As we watched the review process evolve, we started seeing some similar friction to some of our other engineering teams. Stuff like debates over code formatting, really repeated common issues, stuff like that. To me, this sounded like a place to try static analysis tools. There was a lot of worry when we introduced this. Would it be too complex for the research teams to work with or to understand? But fortunately, that hasn't really happened. It's worked really well. The teams have enjoyed it for the most part. Uh, there's some grumbling here and there, but I think everyone acknowledges that it's really improved our code quality overall. I said before that our individual DAG steps are called modules, and I'm not gonna get too deep into the technology, but in specific terms, these are celery worker daemons listening on RabbitMQ queues. The important thing, though, is that they're all completely independent software projects. They knit together via these task queues, but each project is independent. It can be managed, deployed, developed, tested, et cetera, all on its own. We have a basic shared skeleton that's 
handling some of the major boilerplate, but inside that skeleton, it's up to each author. So we have some modules that are 99% C++. We have some that are 100% Python. They just make some REST calls. Most of them are somewhere in the middle. They're pure Python technically, but they're calling into stuff like PyTorch or OpenCV or whatever other fancy libraries they find on the internet. Principle for our pipeline and module deployment has been let Noah take a vacation. We want to keep it simple and hands off. The heart of our deployment engine is a small and well tested Kubernetes operator. Being an operator avoids the drift risk of some other tools like Helm. And to make it easier for other teams to control their own release process, the only input required to create a release is creating and pushing a Git tag. After that, the automation takes over. Originally, we followed a standard three component Semver model, but we found that really limiting. It started to get into a lot of, is this a patch? Is this a feature release? That argument never goes well, even when you're dealing with software engineers and with researchers, it was just impossible. So we have streamlined it to be a little bit simpler. So what we have now, the main branch pushes to a continuously updating latest release. And whenever you create a tag, we only use two versions. So we have a major and a minor. And that automatically creates a release branch and starts CI building images for that release branch. So everything is either a merge to main, which updates latest, or it's a major release or a minor release. And we don't have to deal with patches versus uh, features. So we have a bunch of container images being built by CI. What now? In a normal application, we'd have one copy of a thing running, and you'd have a new version, and then you deploy the new version over the old version in whatever fancy way you want. Here we do it a little bit differently. Instead, we leave every version running indefinitely, listening on different task queues. The idea of this is that if a researcher is heads down in some complex subsystem, if they don't want to test against a moving environment, they can keep their entire microservice environment completely static until they're ready to test with new stuff. They'll have to upgrade at some point because the new pipelines are going to have new versions of stuff, but it lets us play a little bit fast and loose with the release management. You can think of this as blue-green deployment, but with a much larger rainbow. But running everything forever would get very expensive. So our solution here is just more auto-scaling. Uh, specifically, we use Kida with the Kubernetes horizontal pod autoscaler system. We did write our own uh, load estimator, but honestly, if you're just getting started with something like this, Kida's built-in RabbitMQ or even other task queue system load estimation is pretty solid. But the end result of this is every version is running, but they don't take any resources until somebody asks for it. If there's been one problem with our versioning, though, it's those dash latest instances I mentioned. It's overall positive, or I wouldn't be recommending them. The problem is it's a point where multiple people can collide and, co and, and overlap each other in terms of code development. The main benefit, though, is that it allows us to run a lot more tests before we cut a release. So in CI, we're running maybe five to 10 different canned work units. Before a release, we want to throw a couple dozen at it. We used to do those pre-release tests just on a developer workstation, but that was slow at the time. Now it would just be excruciating. Overall, I think this has been a win, but just know the risks. Once we have a bunch of running modules, we need the DAG to connect them all up. We started with just plain JSON definitions in a text file. That got unwieldy real fast. So we moved to a GUI editor with a database. This was good for a while. Uh, having a, a GUI editor let the teams self-service a lot of changes. But it started to get pretty unwieldy as we ended up with like a lot of repeated subunits in all of our pipelines. So we've now moved to a very thin Python DSL that compiles back to the same JSON we had at the beginning. This gives us programmatic flexibility when we're developing the DAGs, but we don't need the overhead and complexity of a full runtime environment while the DAG is executing. We have two main types of pipeline definitions. The, the big complicated fancy ones are the system default pipelines. Those are things like the one that's actively taking user traffic or the ones that used to be taking user traffic and now exist for debugging or will hopefully someday be taking user traffic after they are properly tested. But we also have these one-offs. Those live pretty much only in our staging environment, and they're there for researchers that are developing or testing a specific module. Usually they're a subset of all of the modules, so they don't have to test against the full system, and letting them easily create and modify those has been a huge uh, iteration time improvement. So this structure gives us all the tools we need to build a full release process. There's four main gates. Pull request merge in the module, module release, pipeline release, and pipeline promote to be the default for all user traffic. We tend to let module and uh, 
We tend to let module merges and releases happen whenever it makes sense, up to those teams to deal with. And then pipeline releases are on a weekly cadence to match our full corpus test run cycle every weekend. That's that big 14 hour thing I mentioned. All of this so far has been workflow and development tooling, but what about production? In keeping with the theme of guardrails, we have some helpers too. The big one is our core utils library. So I'm sure most people have these somewhere, the junk drawer library. Uh, it covers common functionality. The important thing though is that this library can be held to a higher quality standard than the underlying modules because it looks more like a traditional software project. So we can do things like actually insist on unit test coverage and stuff like that. We've also set up a lot of the configuration of the underlying modules to be config file driven rather than code driven. So stuff like which asset files need to get synced in and out into each module, that's all done in a config file. It makes it easier for the module authors to control that themselves. If I had to pick one runtime support feature though, it's automatic retries. It's a simple thing, but a lot of this science isn't an exact science and slow completion is usually better than none. You do have to have monitoring in place to make sure your error rate doesn't spike, but structured and controlled retries are worth their weight in gold in an experimental system. And the flip side of retries is timeouts. So you want retries to improve your availability at the sake of performance. Timeouts cap your availability, but they give you at least an outside chance of having decent performance in failure situations. Every DAG runner system is gonna have some kind of overall timeout on each work unit, and depending on your code, you can hopefully have them on internal steps as well. A pro tip for monitoring, anything that has a timeout in it should have a histogram metric or whatever it's called in your monitoring stack. I'm not gonna harp on it too much because you've heard a million people tell you that structured logging is good, but no really, it's good, you should do it. The key feature for us was using the Python struct log library to attach uh, lot, data to each log line. So stuff like the, the individual work unit ID, the pipeline ID, the module versions, all of that, we can slice and dice it in Loki after the fact, and all of that can live in the shared utilities library. The module authors don't even have to know this is happening. We did opt for log format instead of JSON for our structured output, just because it is more human readable. Technical solutions are important, but for any developer to feel happy and supported, we need social support systems too. We tried office hours early on, and we got some people coming, but relatively low uptake. Even with the prompting of there will be formal office hours from X to Y, there was a lot of I don't wanna bother you and things like that. And as our time zone footprint has grown across the teams, it's been harder to schedule those. Internal presentations helped a little bit more, but it's hard to wrangle volunteers for those, and we've had a consistent problem that the further the team is from the presenter, the more incomprehensible the subject matter will be. Testing weeks were where we really found success, though. Test weeks are a recasting of a tech debt week or a personal projects week. For five days, we put all feature developments and non-critical bug fixes in the back burner, and everyone works on quality-related projects. For our research teams, this has mostly meant improving test coverage, upgrading dependencies, and cleaning up data fixtures. This is also how we introduced that static analysis setup that I talked about before, which worked really well because everyone was learning at the same time and they could all help support each other. We aim to do these around once a quarter, scheduled as best we can to avoid any major external deadlines. Like most of you, I hope, we have a suite of tools for debugging issues in production as well. Our main application is written in Django, so we lean heavily on Django admin UIs for internal debugging. I'll probably regret advocating for custom admin views on a stage, but it's honestly been working pretty well for us so far. Uh, we also make a lot of Grafana dashboards for other teams to use, and we do a lot of Slack bot messages. It's been particularly good for error conditions and for daily reports. Domo, or pick your other business intelligence tool of choice has been really helpful for having a tool for people that aren't super technical to quickly build visualizations. Uh, they're almost always not going to be as flexible as Grafana or other dedicated ops viz tools, but they're way easier to use and to learn and we're glad to have both. As with alerting projects, our training corpus is huge and important. Many of these corpus units were created by the teams themselves during development, so personal info isn't a worry but we're always gonna have edge cases coming in from production from real users. So legally, our terms of service authorizes us to use user data to improve the service, et cetera, et cetera, but ethically, we wanna be good stewards of our user data. Our flow generally is if we get a weird edge case from production, we'll ask our internal QA teams to try to make a reproduction case. If they fail, we'll ask our paid user testers. If they also fail, then we look at introducing user data into our training corpuses. We've set it up so that researchers cannot see PII anywhere in any of our admin tools, and if you add user data to a corpus, it is permanently anonymized no matter what. On the planning organization side, we do our strategic planning in four-month blocks. We aim for a mix of top-down for external priorities and bottom-up for internal ones. 
Where this intersects our topic here is mostly just stressing that research teams should actually be included in planning. <laughs> Getting early signs of friction is really important to keeping ahead of it. Not everything has been perfect though, so for balance, let's talk through some of our pain points. We do our best to wrap developer tools in things like easy to use bash scripts or make files, but weird failures, stuff like Python dependency solver errors, those messages have to go somewhere. Those error messages are usually only barely understandable if you have deep knowledge of the tools and they're completely incomprehensible to everyone else. This is a problem for every team, but especially here. Academia plays a bit fast and loose with software and data licensing sometimes. Machine learning in general is really crowded with intellectual property. It's hard to navigate even for people that are really experienced. Uh, we've done a lot of internal training and it's helped a lot here, but we have to keep an eye on it because we're only as strong as our weakest link. And I'm going to tempt fate and mention that we don't yet have an on-call rotation for our researchers. Uh, we have one for the, the platform team, but at some point we're probably going to need to put researchers on call and it's probably not going to be very popular. <laughs> so, what did we learn here today? Most of this is all the usual wisdom for any self-service platform, but tweaked a bit for the needs of a research organization. Build tools with empathy as a feature and everyone benefits. DAG runner tools help keep complex systems manageable and accessible. Running old versions in parallel allows for looser release management as long as input and output contracts are kept to. Automatic retries at every level of the system helps keep things reliable in the face of randomness. Observability should be for everyone, not just SREs, so work with your teams to expose the data they need and keep your plans aligned so everyone is moving forward together. And really, in the end, be kind and open and empathetic, and you'll end up with a system that helps everyone be at their best. And in the end, that's what we're all here for. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes for questions.